Well, this morning is the last of the scriptures from Mark that we will be looking at in this thread of sermons uh, that I have laid out to start my time with you here at Christ by the Sea. And I want to say it's been a joy for me to get to walk through these various stories of God's good news with you. And uh, I love how we've been able to look at all these different sorts of ways that God's good news, God's gospel of love for this world has, uh, has presented itself in such different circumstances here in just these few chapters of Mark. Uh, today's scripture has one more surprising way that good news pops its head up. And so I'm going to get started with the scripture right away. We're reading out of Mark chapter 7, and I'm going to pause just a few times as I read the scripture with a, with a couple notes, then we'll unpack it a bit. So it starts this way. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. And pause. First, I want, to, uh, I, I want you, good people of Vero Beach especially, to see that when it says Jesus is going to Tyre, it's a way alike that if, if uh, Jesus did ministry in Florida 2,000 years ago, and it said Jesus went away to Vero Beach. The tire is on the beach, and it's, a, it's as close as you could have to a resort town back then. And Jesus is he's trying to boop, boop, run away. He's trying to boop, boop, get away. Marcos, this is why I'm not joining the choir. Was, uh, you get a little bit of tainted love out of me, and that's it. But, but the, the, Jesus is exhausted. He is physically weary. He is mentally weary. He needs to just hear the waves. He needs to just sit by the waves and and, and just think and just dream a bit and just be renewed. He's trying to relax for a minute. But it says at the end of that very first verse that we read, he could not escape notice. Verse 25, but a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him. And she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin, and she begged Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter. So I'm going to pause here. Uh, We've got this scene that has been repeated. I I don't know how many times at this point out of the, uh, I think it's been 12 sermons that, that we've done out of Mark, it's been at least half of those, if not more, that that upon an encounter, the person has bowed to Jesus. This sign of uh, recognition, Lord, you, you're the one. And this desperate mom comes during this time where Jesus is worn down. She, she, it says that she is Syrophoenician of, of nature, and, and the, the exact location may not matter a whole lot for most of us, but the main thing to take away here is that she is not Jewish. She, she's a Gentile woman coming to Jesus. Now, when it comes to that Syrophoenician part, I happen to have a soft spot in my heart for the Phoenicians. Uh, after all, uh, I can read because of them uh, with the Phoenician alphabet. And if you've ever ridden that ride at Epcot that goes through the golf ball, they tell you, next time you read, thank the Phoenicians. So I've got a soft spot in my heart for this woman already. But, but even more than just simply the Phoenician connection, she's a desperate mom with a very sick child on her hands. And at the same time, the stage has already been set that we can feel Jesus' Jesus's fatigue. We can feel his frustration, his desire to boop, boop, get away. He doesn't want to be healing right now. He needs some healing. So she has come to him in verse 27. This is Jesus' response to her request that he would heal her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first. For it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. We're going to come back to that expression because if if that expression didn't shock you upon hearing it, I'll try and help it shock you a little bit better. Jesus said, you feed the food to the children first. You don't throw it to the dogs. Verse 28, but she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table get to eat the children's crumbs. And then he said to her, for saying that, you may go. And the demon has left your daughter. And so she went home and she found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. And before I ask for God's blessing on this scripture, 
I just want to lift up that Jesus' words to this woman were about children and dogs, were about dogs and children. And as the story continues, we find that there's good news for all. We ask that God indeed would add blessing and understanding to this, the reading aloud, the hearing, and most importantly for us, that God would bless a living out. And maybe today it's even more appropriate to say a living into of these words of Holy Scripture. So I want to set the stage for unpacking this a little bit by starting with a question, because really, I think that where we answer this question sort of depends what track we end up taking with this scripture and, and why it might have some sort of meaningful impact for us. It, here's the question. The question is, did Jesus have to learn anything while he was a human? And we know Jesus, part of the triune God, uh, emptied himself and came from heaven to earth and took the form of a baby boy. But as that baby boy came into this world, what do we believe about what he knew? Did Jesus of Nazareth, as a newborn baby, know only the same two things that every baby born, born into this world knows? Did he know how to cry and did he know how to sleep? I mean, surely he knew those, but did he know only that? And then all the other stuff, did he have to, did he have to learn it? Did he have to learn how to tie his shoes? Did he have to learn the Phoenician alphabet? Well, he would have learned the Aramaic alphabet and the Hebrew alphabet. Did, did Jesus have to learn how to be a stonemason like his father Joseph? Did, did he learn these things or was he born as this little baby with a little baby brain that had all the knowledge of God within it? That question bears a big impact on this story. What did Jesus know and when did he know it? And some, I mean, that's a bit of a noodle bender if you really, if you really think on it. We, we have this curious story of Jesus at age 12, uh, staying behind in the temple while his parents left. You may remember this. Parents, if you've heard this story when you had a young child, whoever walked away from you in a, in a mall or a toy store, you immediately know this story. You, you thought, Jesus, mm, I'll give you the business. You scared the daylights out of me. But it says at the conclusion of that story where Jesus was talking with the, the teachers of the scriptures and with the people who were uh, sort of having debate and argument about what is God trying to say through the scriptures, it says then in Luke 2.52 that following that, Jesus continued to grow in wisdom, mind, in stature, body, and in favor with God and people with relationships, that Jesus, as a 12-year-old, had some growing to do, and he continued. In those ways, Jesus was a lot like me, growing from boys to men, ABC, BBD. None of you are boys to men fans, I can tell. <laughs> Have you heard? There's a 90s R&B group called Boys to Men. They did a lot of romantic songs, okay? So sue me. So I like the boy band. All right. So, but, but me and Jesus, and you and Jesus, we grew from child to adult, those of us that are adults. And I always love what Bear Grylls says. He says, people will ask me sometimes, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, Bear Grylls is this adventurer type. He doesn't really have a job except for playing outside. And uh, they said, what are you going to do when you grow up? And he says, why would I ever want to do that? I don't want to grow up. But, but if even Bear Grylls and even Jesus and even me and you, we got to grow up some. We grow up in some ways and we learn some things. So with that in mind, I've, uh, I've preached on this scripture maybe half a dozen times over the course of my, uh, my pastorate, and, and I first encountered this scripture over 20 years ago when I was in an upper-level Greek class, and our, our job, our only assignment in the class was week by week we were translating through the book of Mark from Greek into English. And I remember when I first translated this scripture... I came to class and I told my professor, I, I, something isn't lining up right. Like I'm missing a word, I'm missing a verb tense. This doesn't mean, I'm sure it can't mean what I'm translating it because this woman, this mother desperately comes to Jesus and says, help me, help my daughter. And Jesus says, my gift isn't for you. It's for the children. You don't give the gift to the dogs. And I, I said, is that what Jesus is saying here? 
And, and my professor said, yeah, it is what Jesus is saying here. And, and again, like I've told you, I've preached this scripture since then. And truthfully, a bunch of those times that I've preached it, I've always had to do some like uh, gymnastics. I'll call them biblical gymnastics to try and explain it because it's a really jerk thing of Jesus to say, right? I mean, it, it seemed that way to me anyway. I shouldn't put that on you. Maybe to you it seems like, oh yeah, of course, Jesus, king of the Jews, would say to this Gentile woman, not for you. But to me, that sounded different than the gospel I had heard my whole life. And I'd heard it mostly in Gentile churches. That, that God so loved the world and that Jesus came for all and and that I, I've even read these stories of Jesus speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well and Jesus going to lands beyond the borders and saying to them, God's love extends to you. But, but now I'm reading in this moment, Jesus says, the gift isn't for you first. And what's, what, what's going on with that? And why would Jesus be that kind of pointed with this woman who seems like she's just like any desperate parent would be? You don't take children's food and feed it to the dogs. This Gentile mother and her daughter to Jesus. This is, this is where I'm going with the learning bit. That as Jesus spent 30 years of his life learning how to tie his shoes and learn the alphabet and learn to be a stonemason and learn all the things that he learned, something else that he learned over 30 years was sort of the imprinting of his community about their view of others. That, that Jesus of Nazareth, not sinful in it, simply absorbing his context. How many times had he heard, oh yeah, Gentiles, forget about them. They never get it. Syrophoenician Gentiles, whew, stay away. Mixed breed, dirty dogs. You know, there, there's this Americanizing, modern day Americanizing we can do to this scripture. And I've done it in preaching. That, that's part of this gymnastics thing of like, well, you know, dogs are kind of cuddly. And when Jesus says that the food is for the children, not the dogs, it's not really that bad because we, I, I've had dogs that I've loved like they were my children. Some of you have known what it is to nurse and care for your sick pets day and night as though they were part of your family. This is not the context of Jesus 2,000 years, years ago, though. <clears throat> in in Jesus' context, Dogs are scavenger, nuisance beasts. They're a threat to spread disease. They're a threat to take that which doesn't belong to them. <clears throat> and Jesus isn't offering any sort of kindness. As he says, my gift of healing. And remember, Jesus is in a tired way in this moment. <clears throat> He's in a tired way. He says, my gift is first for the children, not for the dogs. Where did Jesus get the idea that Syrophoenicians were dogs? He didn't get it from God. He didn't get it from his pre-existent self that existed in heaven before being emptied into the form of a human. He, he simply absorbed it. <clears throat> Excuse me in my, uh, my uh, throat clearing. You can clear. Sometimes after a sermon, there's like 40 people who clear their throats. And I say, God bless you for holding it so long. Let's all clear our throats for a second. <laughs> <clears throat> I feel much better now. Much better. You can always clear your throat if you need to during a sermon. Don't, that can make somebody go crazy to hold back on a cough or a sneeze like that. But Jesus, what, what I want to propose is that Jesus, Jesus had built in him by nature of simply existing as a human and being part of what tribes are. Not just the tribe that Jesus was a part of 2,000 years ago as a human being in Nazareth, but tribes even that exist today that get imprinted on us, these are our people and these aren't. That Jesus continued to grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and people. And part of how that happened in that journey, and I think it's a really pivotal way, is this story with the Syrophoenician woman and her daughter. Because here's something that Jesus can't resist. Jesus gives his quick response to this woman, and he gives it in the form of a parable. Children and dogs, what's more important? What gets my time? What, what gets my energy? It's the children, not the dogs, not you. And the woman responds back, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. 
This woman was warned. She was given an explanation by Jesus, and nevertheless, she persisted. She said, Jesus, can you have mercy on even the dogs? Can we gather up that which falls off the table? Can we have just a crumb? This is a lot like a woman who thought if I touch just a, just a tiny thread coming off of the garment, I can be healed. So this woman thinks if I can have just a tiny morsel of that which is overflowing on the table above, then my daughter can be healed. And so Jesus can't argue with that. Jesus doesn't want to argue with that. It says in Mark, when he responds, for saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. But I want to give you his response in the gospel of Matthew as well. Matthew records this story. And Matthew, just like uh, the gospels that share stories, they all have a, a little different perspective on how it went down. And Matthew says this as Jesus' response. And I think it's an awestruck response from Jesus. When she outclevers Jesus, when he wants to deny her the blessing, and she says, even the crumbs, even the dogs get those, I think he says, whew, you're not supposed to be able to do that to me. I'm Jesus. But you just made a whole lot of sense. Jesus says this, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. Jesus in spite of the three decades of stuff that had been put on him about who are children of God and who are the dogs that are, that are a nuisance, that are scavenging around the fringes trying to take that doesn't, which doesn't belong to them, Jesus sees the divine spark in this woman. Jesus sees the humanity in this woman. He sees a child of God, not a dog. I think Jesus learned something by unlearning something here. We, we see the shift dramatically in Matthew, more so than the other Gospels. In Matthew, there is what could be described as an anti-Gentile bias through the first third of the Gospel. Here, here are some examples. These are ways that Jesus would have learned and understood who the Gentiles are. Matthew 10 don't go any of the ways that lead to the Gentiles. Matthew 5, if you only greet your brothers and sisters, what good is that? Even the Gentiles do that. Even the dogs greet their masters, Jesus is saying. Matthew 6, when you pray, don't pray like the Gentiles. Praying or heaping empty phrases on top of each other, hoping to be heard. Don't be like them. Matthew 6, don't worry about what you eat or drink or wear. It is the Gentiles who worry about such things. You, you know that your heavenly Father knows what you need. But after Jesus' encounter with the Syrophoenician woman, it's very interesting that we don't read again another teaching of Jesus where he says, us here, them here, don't be like them about the Gentiles anyway. Now, he has plenty to say still about religious leaders, but that's across the board. And I know as one. But Jesus has his perspective clarified. Jesus has this bread of life. And who gets to eat of it? The children or the dogs? And this Syrophoenician woman, this desperate mother, has said, can't even the dogs have the crumbs? And it was that in which Jesus said, you know what? It's Oprah time. You get a loaf of bread, and you get a loaf of bread, and you get a loaf of bread. There's no withholding anymore past this point in the Gospels that Jesus does for the withholding of the bread of life. This is what starts to form the words that we get in the much later written book of John, where Jesus declares, for God so loved the world. God so loved all y'all that I came so that there would be a way for you to know that love and to live in that love. Uh, I, I want to close by sharing that a beloved friend of mine died this past week. She had been diagnosed shortly before I came to Christ by the Sea with terminal cancer. Uh, she's a close friend and mentor of mine. 
And uh, of course, I've had all sorts of memories going through my mind these last few days of uh, experiences I shared with her and uh, things that she said to me. And, and I thought that this fits so well to close this sermon as I think about Kathy, uh, that Kathy very often would close our, uh, our conversations by saying, she would always say it like she had just thought of it, even though I know she had well thought of it. And I think she closed every conversation with everyone this way. But she would say, like it just came off the top of her head, she'd go, hey, you know what, and Michael, you know what? I go, what? And she goes, God loves you. And not only does God love you, God's crazy about you. That was her thing, that was her phrase. She wanted everybody to know. She was a pastor for 30 years, then she was a spiritual director for 10 years on top of that. And she wanted everybody to know, you're not, you're not here when it comes to God, you're here. God's crazy about you. Friends, I say to you this morning, God's crazy about you. It tells us in the scriptures that God sings songs over you. It tells us in the scriptures that you are the delight of God's heart. It tells us that God's heartbeat for how God will act in this world is on your behalf. God so loved this world, meaning you meaning our siblings around this world, each one of them, God shaped them, God walked with them, God loves them, God loves you, and all are God's children. They don't need the crumbs, and you don't need the crumbs. We all have access to the bread of life. Praise be to God. Let's pray. Lord, let us see as you see let us see ourselves, let us see others, let us see this life with your eyes, Lord. Lord, let us grow in our awareness of the love that you have for us. Lord, may we be reminded of Kathy's exhortation that you're crazy about us. You delight in us. You want the best for us. Lord, let us live as people of good news. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.